Alrighty, so we will be reading Acts 8, 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of, passage of the scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his hum- humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please. Who is he talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Is there anyone else looking around at what, who's wearing what today and what colour they're wearing? <laughs> Notice Matt didn't talk about his own sweater, which is, which is quite stylish. <laughs> his wife brought it. Mel, did you buy his sweater? Well, morena te Fano or Tutorangi Baptist Church. My name's Phil, and together with Susie, we're members here at Tutorangi Baptist Church. Um, I thought it was really kind of Matt to ask me to share about my namesake in the Bible, a guy named Philip. I'm just not sure whether I'm his namesake or he's mine. Not quite sure where that lands. I'm going to ask a lot of questions this morning, so bear with me. Um, Have you ever felt like you didn't have all the answers? I felt like you had some knowledge, but... We're reaching through smoke to discover the true meaning of what it was you were confronted with. Have you been reluctant to ask for help? Perhaps for fear of being shown up by others, those who are smarter than you, maybe people who might expose your own lack of knowledge or your lack of experience. Have you read something and just struggled to make sense of it, to understand what it means at all or, or what it means for me. I've been in that place just a few years ago, 2021. Who remembers 2021? We'd all rather not, right? Mid-COVID. I had uh, just started in the middle of the year with Laidlaw College. I was about two months into the role. And Roshan Allpress, who's our national principal, he pulled me aside and he had a chat and he said, remember remember during the recruitment process? And that triggered stuff because it was a a three-month-long discernment process where I feel like I met just about half the staff of the college over three months. Remember, he says, when when I said, "I I was thinking about taking a sabbatical sometime soon? I've spoken with the board and... We feel like there will never be a perfect time. So, I'm going to take it starting in October, the month after next, returning to work in July the following year. Phil, he said, how do you feel about being acting principal while I'm away? (laughs) I'm not often speechless. Susie will tell you, I've got plenty to say. My school reports were contributes well to class discussion. 
This was a moment for me going, me? The principal of a theological college? All these thoughts raging through my mind. I just got here. I'm the least qualified. Literally, unlike most of the rest of the leadership team, I don't have a PhD. I'm married to a PhD. Doesn't really help, but I don't even have a master's degree. I'm two months into a new role in a sector I'm still getting to grips with. How am I going to lead in a space where I don't necessarily understand what I'm reading or what I'm hearing? What if I make mistakes? What if I... What if I screw it all up? Everyone is going to look to me. Who will I look to? What about this COVID-19 thing and lockdowns and all that stuff? I don't think I'm qualified. Today, we're looking at a short vignette in the book of Acts. It's a story of encounter, of humility and vulnerability and of response to God's invitation. Over these last few weeks, through this series of Jesus, People and Places, we've been exploring encounters that Jesus had with a quite a wide variety of people. Through the use of acting and preaching and art, we're endeavoring to bring these well-known stories to life helping us connect with these really transformative encounters. This morning, we're looking at a story that takes place after Jesus has died. After he has risen from the dead and ascended, leaving his disciples to continue his mission. It's here that we meet Philip, who is about to encounter, like Jesus before him, a person who did not fit the religious mold of ancient Jerusalem or Judaism, but like others that we have heard of in this series, is a person desperately seeking the Jewish Messiah. Before we look at what we can learn from the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, I wonder if you've been seeing a number of threads coming together over these last few weeks. We've explored so many situations where Jesus encounters people often on the margins of society. Consider the story of the Samaritan woman at the well who meets with Jesus. Karen Rick Hansen asked, have you ever been so thirsty that your tongue stuck to the roof of your mouth? Karen speaks of true satisfaction that is found in living water. She spoke of true union, A sacred relationship with God that fulfills the deepest longings. True worship in spirit and truth, which is not bound by place or by culture. In the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, I think Caleb just laid it on Zach. Caleb reminded us of what Tim Keller says, who says, our biggest need is to be fully known and truly loved. It's about acceptance. We build identification and identities at school and uni and our careers through relationships. Zacchaeus had a prominent role. He had means, but something was missing in his life. Remember, remember the religious, religious leaders that though they had society's acceptance, they responded with bitterness, maybe even jealousy towards Zacchaeus when he was called by Christ. The crowd, they justified their behavior, but they were also proud. Pride was a barrier for many in that story, but not for Zacchaeus, as he put his pride aside to accept Jesus' invitation. Matt told the story of the thief on the cross. Matt reminded us that the second criminal rebuked the first criminal because he recognized Jesus' true identity. The second criminal makes a humble plea, not not to fix his circumstances, but for Jesus to remember him. Instead of turning inwardly, he turns to Christ. On that day, only one criminal knew of his need of Jesus and was not too proud to ask. Just last week, 
Grace shared the powerful story of the woman who bled. If you haven't heard that message or you feel like a refresher, can I encourage you? Watch it again. The story of Jesus being on his way somewhere, but he took the time to be interrupted. The woman being ceremonially uncleaned, she couldn't participate in temple worship. She had a personal encounter with Jesus. Her life is transformed forever. And then we come to today, an encounter between a disciple of Jesus in the most random of places with a person far outside of Philip's ordinary. It's complicated. You see, Stephen and I were like brothers, serving together, releasing the apostles to their ministry. We administered community meals and contributed to the sharing of the widow's gifts, trying without much success to break the past generations of suspicions between Jews from Judea and Jews from the empire. You wouldn't believe the petty jealousies. It was made all the harder by people's unruly hearts and prejudices. It was those unruly hearts and prejudices that ended Stephen's life. In a hail of rocks and a cascade of hypocrisy, his body broke and so did our hearts. And then Saul, with all the fury of Satan himself, broke out against the people of the way. So we made our way out of Jerusalem and Judea. I made haste north to Samaria, away from trouble. Maybe my ministry was over. Maybe I was running away. Maybe. But even there, the way himself, Jesus, was showing me the way. He opened doors, he opened my mouth, and he opened people's hearts to receive his eternal life. Those were remarkable days. Samaritans turning to Christ in faith. Even a magician. (laughs) But that's a story for another day. I have a more more remarkable story to tell, if you'll listen. I know even more than the spirit falling on Samaritans and magicians being blinded by faith. The spirit spoke to me, loud and clear, commanding. Head out to Gaza's road. It's a four-day walk, but how do you say no to God? So I went, but in three or four steps only. I was there on that road four days south when I encountered it. I heard it before I saw it. The chariot came by, pulled by horses and driven by slaves. There sat a man with skin blacker than I've seen before, wealthy, robed, powerful, so clearly different from the Samaritans. This must have been my meeting today. So I ran and I matched its pace. He was reading aloud from the prophet, his voice as rich as Africa's gold, as broad as its plains, as loud as Rome's legions. It was strange to hear these all familiar words in his deep foreign voice. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Are you understanding it? I shouted from the road. He was startled by my question, as startled as I'd been to find myself there on that road. He jumped down. How can I understand unless someone explains it to me, he said. Jesus himself made a way for me into that man's chariot as I explained that Jesus is the one the prophet spoke of. Jesus made his way into that man's heart. What's to stop me, he asked, from being baptized? There's a list, I thought. So many things. You're not one of God's chosen people. You're unfit to enter the temple. Your culture is alien. Your food is foreign. You belong elsewhere. But what was this list? A list of requirements written by who? 
Were we not people of the way? Was Jesus not that way? Had he not commanded us, go, teach, disciple, and baptize all nations? Go from Jerusalem, Judea, into Samaria. Yeah. Into Samaria and on to the ends of the earth. Here was a man from earth's end, a man who I was to baptize. Look, he shouted, there's our water, an oasis pool. We climbed down from the chariot and we entered into the water. There I asked him where his hope lay, in the way of Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord of all, died but resurrected and coming again. He entered the water and rose, reborn to a cry of hallelujah. (laughs) Then we parted ways, never to see each other again. And yet now, forever, family. While reading and praying through this passage over the last couple of weeks, I found that I was asking myself a lot of questions. Lucky you, you all get to share in my questions. I feel like the Holy Spirit is is speaking to us, doing something with us throughout this series. I feel like He's asking us to examine our hearts and our motivations. Our willingness to be active apprentices for Jesus. So let's, let's work through the passage in a little bit more detail and see what, see what the Holy Spirit might be saying. Verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, the word for south in doing a bit of digging around might also be translated as going at noon. Noon. In the desert. Imagine how hot that would have been. Not many people will be on the road in the middle of the day. It would be a time when most people would choose not to travel. So why there and why now? I mean, come on, at least... At least in the cool of the morning, before the sun scorches the ground, or in the evening when when the sun has disappeared for the day. Why now? Because to Philip, God says so. Because God has a plan. Philip, having seen and experienced much, he follows the prompt from the angel of the Lord, and he started out towards that road. How do you say no to God? For me, and probably for some, of, for, for some of you, all too easily. Because my response is often dependent on me, not on him. Philip's example, like the calling of the disciples before him, is to do what God asks of him. That's quite challenging for us in our 21st century context, to drop everything and respond to what God is saying. Often we, we overanalyze. We talk ourselves out of stuff. We consider the task much too big. We forget that if, if God is calling, then he also has a plan. What if we responded positively and we, we took those first few steps into that unknown What might God do and who might we encounter along the way? Verse 27, so he started out and on his way he meets an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Let's learn a little bit about who this Ethiopian eunuch 
was. If you remember in Grace's message last week, she invited us, particularly us boys, if you remember, to be brave, given her topic. Well, let's all be brave again today, shall we? Because today we're talking about castration. Which is one of those topics which I skip over, like circumcision earlier in the Bible. I did a bit of looking around about what it, what it means to be a eunuch, a, a eunuch in ancient times and um, where else but the Encyclopedia Britannica to get a wee summary, which is quite useful. So eunuchs in ancient times were usually castrated males. They were employed in two main functions as guards and servants in harems or other women's quarters. And as chamberlains chamberlains to kings, eunuchs were considered the most suitable guards for many wives or concubines a ruler might have in their palace. And the eunuchs' confidential position in harems of princes frequently enabled them to exercise an important influence over their royal masters and even to raise themselves to stations of great trust and great power. Some rose to become bodyguards, confidential advisors, and even ministers, generals, or admirals. Most eunuchs underwent castration as a condition of their employment. Though others were castrated as punishment or after they had been sold by poor parents. How are your employment conditions feeling right now? Mine are feeling pretty good. Bladewell College hasn't asked that of me. If you think back to the book of Esther, Esther speaks of Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem. And in fact, in the book of Esther, the king has a whole bunch of eunuchs in charge of the women. Other historical texts tell of eunuchs often serving as treasurers for royalty or prominent families. So... A very painful physical experience was rewarded with high office, with responsibility and authority. It's a pretty brutal way to get high office, don't you think? Don't even think about the ancient tools. My advice, if I'm really honest, is don't spend too much time searching for information on eunuchs and castration. Just don't. No images, you'll notice. Um... Yeah. Further, the eunuch is identified ethnically as an Ethiopian. So he's probably not born a Jew, but but he was returning from worshipping in Jerusalem. He clearly believed in Yahweh. Now, Deuteronomy tells us that eunuchs could not become proselytes, so he could not truly convert to Judaism. So he's not quite the same as other Jews, even if he believes in Yahweh. Other texts tell us that eunuchs were despised and derided by both Greco-Romans and Jewish ancient society. Sure, he's a treasurer of the queen mother, the ruling monarch of the kingdom of Meadow, but he's despised. Historical manuscripts tell us this kingdom, it's a large kingdom, covered what is now southern Sudan, From the south of Aswan to Khartoum, between the first and sixth cataracts of the Nile, so quite a large area. It was a wealthy kingdom with iron smelting, gold mining, and had a very strategic trading position. It served as a conduit for goods from the rest of the whole of that continent. In light of all this, returning from Jerusalem, the eunuch was trying to understand the scriptures. He was probably reading aloud, which is why Philip heard him, That was the custom of the time, and that was often because the manuscripts that they were reading were kind of devoid of spacing and punctuation. It was kind of long lines of text. So reading aloud helped you make sense of it. So this Ethiopian eunuch, powerful, exotic, despised, literate, Of means, he's driving a chariot, and pious, a religious man, a believer in Yahweh, returning from worship and reading scripture. 
It's quite a complex character. This man had things done to him that disqualified him from society and from religious practice. He wasn't able to enter the temple to worship. He could only worship on the edges of the temple because he wasn't fully a Jew. Jesus removes that disqualification, as we see later on in the story, and qualifies him. Have there been things done to us that we felt disqualify us? A bit like I was feeling when asked to step into a leadership role at the college. Let's go to verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now let's consider Philip. He's experienced a lot. Some of it really good and some of it truly harrowing. Commissioned by the apostles in Acts chapter 6. And then he's seen his fellow disciples stoned to death. Stoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's been scattered by the wrath of Saul and he finds himself in Samaria. Philip is filled with the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders are evident. Many were believing in Jesus Christ and many were becoming baptized. So much so that Peter and John came in support, we read Uh, between Acts 6 and 8. All the time, Philip is hearing from and he's heeding the word of the Lord. Philip followed followed the Lord's command to head down that desert road. Now, if he's anything like you and I, he was probably wondering why. It was really hot, dry. He was probably thirsty at noon in the heat of the day. Remember again what Karen challenged us with a few weeks back. Have you ever been so thirsty that your tongue stuck to the roof of your mouth? I imagine Philip was feeling some of that as he walked on that road. Now notice that the dialogue between Philip and the eunuch is almost entirely made up of questions. Hence all my questions. Questions about questions. We can surmise that they spoke a lot together throughout that passage. We can fill in some of the blanks. As Philip unpacked the scriptures and he introduced the eunuch to the Messiah, to Jesus. But the text is all about questions. Verse 30, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. That's a bold question. Surely a question inspired by the Holy Spirit. Philip knew that merely reading the scriptures without knowing the centrality of Christ to what he was reading. If you think about the story of scripture from creation all the way through to new creation and revelation, in the middle, Christ brings it all together. Philip knew that without Christ... Anyone would struggle to make sense of the scriptures. Philip, the evangelist's evangelist, was only too ready to bring the message of life and hope to this traveler on a dusty road. Are we ready to unpack scripture? To answer questions with those whom God places across our path? How well do we recognize God's intervention? especially when it might be towards someone with whom we rarely interact. Verse 31. How can I, the eunuch said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So here's this high official. This is a powerful guy in a chariot being pulled by horses, donkeys, bullocks, take your pick, animals, suddenly interrupted by a complete stranger, immediately sensing the opportunity to learn a bit more, wanting to be fully known and truly loved, just like Zacchaeus. 
It's a very humble question. Admitting that we don't understand or we don't know what to do. It's a hard thing to do. It is for me. Very early in my stint as an acting principal, I sat in a meeting that went something like this. One of my colleagues said, we have to work on our midterm investment plan for TEC. That's driven from the current data out of our SDR, dependent on our SAC funding to forecast our EFTS over the next few years, and that should allow their MOP for next year. I literally, I'm sorry, I need an acronym buster. I don't understand. You know what I learned? Again, because I'm a slow learner. It's never wrong to say you don't understand and to ask for help. I was the boss and I needed help. So here on the dusty road between the eunuch and Philip, there's an open door for God to move through Philip to bring revelation and relationship because of humility on the part of the eunuch. Let's read on. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? So we see a second very respectful question from someone who really wanted to know but was not too proud to ask. The eunuch humbled himself, making himself vulnerable in the hope of learning more about Yahweh and the scriptures that he treated so much to be reading him in his chariot on the way back from Jerusalem. Possibly these scriptures resonated with the eunuch. Deprived of justice, the scripture said. Remember, this was a man likely forcibly castrated with no chance of any descendants. His life choices were taken from him, and now he can't be anything but a royal official. Sure, he was privileged, but there was something going on inside his heart as he was on that journey away from Jerusalem. Similar to the woman at the well, seeking true worship in spirit and in truth, not bound by place and not bound by culture. You see the way these, these different stories, they, they come together. Remember, remember that the eunuch is not well thought of by Jews, or most others. He couldn't convert to Judaism. He couldn't fully participate in temple worship, which is not that dissimilar to the woman bleeding who encountered Christ that day. She was ceremonially uncleaned and she couldn't participate in worship. And yet Christ. And yet the invitation. It was probably a shock for the eunuch to see a a Jewish man approaching his chariot and asking, do you understand what you're reading? A proud man would have spurned Philip's advance, sped up his chariot. Anybody tried to speed up a chariot before? I've been in a horse and cart once in my life. Tough work. Sped up and probably left Philip in the dust. But not this eunuch. He took the time to be interrupted. Perhaps we need to be prepared to be interrupted sometimes. It may be inconvenient, but it may be that God wants to reveal himself afresh in the middle of that interruption. If you think about an interruption of one of, is, is one of God's MOs. Noah, Moses, 
all of the disciples when they were called. God interrupted their lives and set them on a different trajectory. We read on in verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? A third question. What can stand in the way? Remember what Cam shared in his narrative. There's a list, I thought, of many things. You're not of God's chosen people. You're unfit to enter the temple. You're you're culture alien. Your food is foreign. You belong somewhere else. But that is not the way of Jesus. Jesus came to remove barriers to belonging and to enable everyone to qualify for baptism. I had so many reasons why I thought I didn't qualify to be the acting principal. I was the least academically qualified in a college I didn't understand everything I thought I should have. I thought there were smarter, better equipped, and more deserving people to step into that role. People whom I would have gladly supported. But that's not God's way. It turns out that my willingness to ask for help, to be vulnerable and to lean on my colleagues were the ingredients for those around me to embrace my leadership during that season. It turns out, I told you I'm a slow learner, it turns out that God really does know what he is doing. Now, just a quick note. If you've got your Bibles, you'll notice that verse 37 is blank with a couple of brackets around it. Uh, Most manuscripts don't include verse 37, Uh, Some include uh, a verse that says, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That that statement of confession before being baptised. It's not in our text today because it's actually not present in the earliest manuscripts that we find. Um, Some versions will include it because it doesn't contradict Scripture or what, possibly would have happened. One commentary says that the verse is not very Lucan. I like the phrase Lucan, that's why I thought I'd share that. Um, Luke, who's the author of Acts, don't, don't forget, it was probably introduced later on, well after the, the scriptures were originally pulled together. So therefore we don't include it here. Verse 38, and so he gave orders to stop the chariot, then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised them. Now, if you look back through Luke's gospel, he consistently shows that there are, there are now no hindrances to receiving the good news of salvation. Not age, not religious tradition, not race or ethnic origin, and not physical condition, as we saw last week with the woman who was bleeding. My experience tells me that God doesn't place hindrances or barriers on me. No, I can can do that all by myself. And if I'm not careful, I can do that towards others. Fortunately, Jesus invites us to be with him, and it's Christ who qualifies us for our relationship with God. I know that I don't fulfill any kind of list that you could put on me. Jesus fulfills me and qualifies me, and he qualifies you. His disciples realized this, and so they carried this this good news, this gospel, to everyone they encountered. But notice they step out and into the mission of Jesus. They didn't remain where they were. They responded to the call. Likewise, God requires us to step out on a journey into discipleship, a journey being sanctified. Where are we hindering ourselves or others on our journey? 
Do we set up gates or do we set up hurdles for people where, where God just doesn't? Did not Jesus say, go teach, make disciples of all nations, of all people, even those who we think may not qualify? The eunuch has so much against him. Injustice, prejudice, exclusion from temple worship. And yet, the eunuch experiences this invitation into relationship with God. And Philip made himself available to be the vehicle of that invitation. What about you and me? Pride can make it really hard to be vulnerable with God. We all need help in asking God and asking one another, leaning on the body of Christ, because that's what Jesus set up for us. He, he set up what we see here today. We see it outward through the book of Acts and throughout the whole of the rest of the New Testament. We see the church humbly and vulnerably walking together, supporting one another while we continue our journey as apprentices of Christ. Today, again, we're going to make some space so that we can consider what, what God is saying to us, what God is saying to me. I invite you into a time of personal confession and reflection. Where has pride been that hurdle that stops you receiving the invitation of God to be transformed by his power? What are the expectations or barriers that you might have placed on people that might prevent them from receiving that invitation? How can you lean on the body of Christ here at TBC to support your journey of discipleship? Your fellow TBC support crew are available to pray with you today. We're going to have people over here at the front and over here at the front and people in the corner at the back by the cross and in the corner at the back by the doors. They're identified by our lanyards with prayer on them who would love to pray with you as you reflect on what God might be calling you to. Please don't hesitate to seek prayer from the people who make themselves available, all to those around you during this time of reflection. After a, a short time, Wayne will call us together in worship so we can respond further to what God is saying.